just a big Charleston contest. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man. You've reached the house of unrecognized talent. Here at Earth, we have traditions for everything. How to sleep, how to eat, how to wear clothes. This show is our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? I don't know. But it's a tradition. Tradition! Domo Arigato, Mr. Scotto. And welcome back to the Brooklyn's Dad Talks About Everything podcast. On today's podcast, we continue our diatribe against human traditions. Now, I'm a kind of guy, I do Santa Claus, I do Rudolph, but I know they're not real. And I don't pretend they're real, they're just fun. And I'm telling you, that's a lot less dangerous than people who create manger scenes. Here we go. Oh yes, it all seems so bloody easy then, you know, like, what to wear, very serious, like, you know, how am I going to get rid of the pimples, and does she really love me? But now I don't bother about that no more. I know she loves me. All I gotta worry about is standing up. All right, okay. Now I don't know if uh, you know Yoko's gonna sue me for that because that's really just words. That's part of the outro of John Lennon's posthumously released "Borrowed Time" on the outro. Anyway, the point there being, uh, I'm a bit older now. I gotta worry about some things. And yesterday we worried about a tradition of three crosses instead of the five crosses. It's not a terribly serious tradition, just like the Wednesday crucifixion versus Friday, even though there's no way you can get three days and three nights from Friday afternoon to Sunday morning, Uh, particularly just on that tradition. uh, The Lord didn't rise from the dead at sun up. He rose at sundown, which is the beginning of the day. It's the beginning of the day in Hebrewism, according to scripture, would be the sundown is the beginning of the day. So people have sunrise services, that's very nice, it's very pretty, but he didn't actually rise at sunrise, he rose at sundown on the Sabbath. But that's another day, another message for another day. So, carrying on now that we've wandered down this road, I want to talk more about traditions. And I'm a traditional guy, I'm a very traditional guy uh, when it comes to a lot of things. Uh, Again, I'm I'm a big baseball fan, so right now I'm kind of freaking out. Because they have this stupid new rule about in extra innings where they stick a guy on second base to start the inning. It seems very little leaguish to me. Uh, I don't know what you do about ERAs in that situation. I'm sure they have rules for that. But if I were a relief pitcher, I would not be very pleased with such a thing. Uh, Again, I don't know how they figure it out. I'm sure they they have something along those lines. But still, even, even that, people don't understand the game of baseball. You pitch differently with a guy on second than you do with nobody out and nobody on. So it changes the whole dynamic of a relief pitcher coming in with a man on second base, right? It just changes everything. (laughs) The point of that is I'm a very traditional guy when it comes to baseball. Also, they're going to get rid of the pitchers hitting in the National League, which is killing me. I mean, I don't like the the designated hitter in the American League either, Uh, but I'm a National League guy, so I didn't worry too much about it. Anywho, that just gives you some idea of me and tradition. Traditional husband... Again, but I'm also a non-traditional guy to this end. One of the one of the pieces of advice I give to people, young people, the young folk who are thinking about getting married is, and this was advice that I received when I was going through my marriage counseling before I got married, was not to get hung up on how your home was growing up. When you marry somebody else, you're creating a whole new home. So you don't have to do everything the way you did growing up. You can't say, that's not the way we did it. I mean, you know, some traditions are nice, but other, you have to make your own traditions. So I'm not anti-tradition completely at all. I'm also a, uh, an American. I like putting the flag out. Um, I, have, I have a flag out all the time, by the way. And right now I have the North Carolina flag I've been flying lately, but I fly a Christmas flag in December, you know. And again, there's another thing, Christmas. I love Christmas traditions, like uh, going to the mall to see the uh, tree. It's a big tradition in my family. Every December, we go to the mall, we get a cup of coffee, we listen to the music, we go to Santa's village and look at the tree. I believe in none of it. We didn't do Santa Claus with our kids. <laughs> we didn't. I mean, we had, you know, Santa around, but we, we never lied to them. We never said Santa's going to sneak in at night. So we never did any of those traditions. Uh, and I really don't do, you know, the Advent season. 
one of the things that kind of troubled me, and this is this is sort of segueing into what we're going to talk about today more directly, is that when I was at my Southern Baptist Church, uh, one year they got very excited in December because they were going to institute Advent. I guess each individual Southern Baptist Church was allowed to to bring in Advent if they wanted to, and our local church decided to do it, and they all got excited about it. And I'm like, why? Wait a minute. This is what I left. Uh, Advent is not biblical. Again, I'm not burning up buildings because of it. The church my wife and I go to now, they like to light candles in December too. So again, it's kind of a weird thing. I'd rather do the secular traditions because they don't mean anything. There is no Santa Claus. There is no, I'm sorry if there's any kids listening. There is no Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. We didn't do that with any of our children. We sang the songs and we did all that kind of stuff around it, but we never lied to them, right? So it's kind of a weird balance with me, kind of a weird thing with traditions. I love some traditions just for the fun of them and just for, you know, sort of connecting to the past and the season and that kind of thing, but I don't put any stock in them. So people who get upset with me because, you know, I don't care about Santa Claus or I don't care about Rudolph, these are the same people that, you know, they'll do Lent. They'll give up chocolate for Lent or whatever. And again, I've said this about about Lent and this we're going to talk about in, in a little bit here as part of this rant against traditions. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth, took on a, a body of humiliation to identify with us. He walked the earth for roughly 30 some years, uh, three and a half year ministry. He spoke tremendous truths. He went to the cross out of love for us. Uh, he was beaten and crucified. He gave up his spirit willingly on our behalf. He went to the grave, did not see decay, and rose again on the third day, undoing the curse of dust. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Undoing that curse and undoing the curse of death. That those of us who have life through his name can someday see life beyond the grave. Resurrection being the great central, the Lord's resurrection being the great central event of all scripture because in it we see our hope for life again from the dead and our life in a new body of incorruption and an immortal body. And that's the only time we become immortal. You're not running around immortal right now. You don't have an immortal soul. You become immortal, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, in resurrection. Okay? That great event. And then I give up chocolate for Lent. So uh, it's one of those things where, you know, people can do it and... I don't get it though. I, you know, I'd, if you're going to concentrate on this time, if you're going to have a church calendar, which I don't believe in church calendars either, but if you're going to have a church calendar, because it is technically the time of Passover, which was the time when the Lord uh, was the spotless lamb who was sacrificed on our behalf. Okay. If you want to put that together, that's fine. I just don't like formal church calendars, you know, whereby churches, that's a good time for them to raise money, get you to come on Maundy Thursday, Maundy Thursday, forget that day. No, I know. I know it's Monday, Monday. But whenever I see Monday, Thursday on some side, I go, Monday, Thursday. Uh, And then Good Friday, of course. Uh, Again, that's pure tradition. And no way you can get Friday to Sunday. I've seen people try to massage that just to get it in. Uh, But it's a high Sabbath that year. It wasn't just the Sabbath. There's a very, John makes particular note of that, that it wasn't just a regular Sabbath. Anyway, that's another topic for another time. But we, when we look in Scripture and we look at tradition in the Greek canon, what we call the New Testament, it's used 13 times in the Textus Receptus. Now, just as a note here, if you have a modern Bible that doesn't use the Textus Receptus, it actually lists 14 uses, which I'm not quite sure why. Well, I know why it's actually in the, the minority texts. Uh, but it's the word paradosis in Greek. And remember, I don't speak Greek, so if that's... Slightly incorrect on my pronunciation, I'm sorry, but it's paradosis is the word in Greek that's translated 13 times in the Textus Receptus, which is used for things like the King James, the New King James, Young's Literal, those sorts of things. And uh, it's used 14 times, uh, 13 times there, 14 times if you include the one time it's it's in Matthew 15, 2, for some reason in the Texas Receptus, the verse is, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Well, right there, it's actually the word transgress is, is the Greek word parabonio. Apologize for all the Greeks out there. Parabonio for transgress or, you know, violate the tradition of your elders. For some reason in the minority texts, 
text it's paradosis twice why do your disciples paradosis the paradosis of the elders now a, a secondary meaning of paradosis is to not really transgress but to it, it, it i forget the exact wording of it but it, it could fit there anyway that's just a minor point but anyway just using the textus receptus why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders now tradition is almost universally a bad word particularly in the lord's ministry we see it in matthew and mark only that word uh and they're pretty much parallel usages except for there's an additional one there's there's three in matthew and four in mark and the uh, additional one in mark was for the laying aside of the commandment of god you hold the tradition of men the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do this is the lord chastising uh, israel for their particularly the pharisees for their additional traditions the traditions of men they're called and we have a lot of those today a lot more of those than then right and of course, when the Lord's talking elsewhere, he says, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. And that's really the problem with human man-made traditions is not only on their own have they put men into slavery to them uh, or pride. That goes the direction. When you do religious things that aren't scriptural, there's one of two directions. You're either in slavery to it, to fear of violating it, or you become haughty and, and puffed up because of it. Right now, uh, the other one, the Lord is, why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Matthew fifteen three. There's that's those three are all in Matthew fifteen, uh, by the way, which is also the chapter with the Canaanite woman, where the Lord said he came, he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So this all has to do with Israel and their traditions at this point. Paul talks about keeping the traditions that he delivered to them. He does this in his Acts age epistles in First Corinthians, Galatians, right, Second Thessalonians. Now, some of those are traditions of my fathers, but Paul was saying he was zealous of the traditions of his fathers. Uh, again, the fathers always referring to Jews. and But the traditions Paul brought, well, of course, because during the Acts age, Paul was still uh, writing the canon of Scripture, and he was delivering to them in that sense. It's just things that are given verbally to them. Uh, and, and then he writes them down, and they become codified Scripture because Paul was called to write scripture and he was inspired of God. We see at one time post Acts, uh, for those of you who are, follow how I interpret scripture, and that's in Colossians. And Paul, this is where Paul says it's part of the warning of Colossians too. He said, Beware lest any man cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. Now the cheating there is a cheating of reward. Again, this is not cheating of your life. Life's a free gift by faith, right? By grace through faith. Uh, but you can be cheated of reward. And Paul said, let beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty words, empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. And this is not necessarily refer referring to Jewish traditions of washing. It can, but it's also the, generally the traditions of men, the principles of the world, right? This is the, what we see all over the church. This is where the world glorifies some things. I'm seeing an awful lot uh, in some of the social media today from, from Christians, air quote, I don't know them personally, so I'm assuming they are Christians, and they're really giving glory to Good Friday, they're giving glory to Lent, they're giving glory to uh, Easter, all these things which are really human tradition. Now behind that, there is some truth. The Lord was crucified, it was Passover, he is the Passover lamb, and he did raise from the dead, as, we says the, as I've said the last a number of times over many podcasts, the greatest central event of all scripture. Right, and but because of the tradition of the immortal soul from the Greeks, because of this tradition of hell fire, because of the tradition of people dying and going to heaven and having water fights in the river of life, amen. You know, because of those human traditions, we have diminished the glory, the glory of the the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've almost completely forgot about the not corrupting in the grave. Peter and Paul, as I've mentioned a thousand times. This is a major part of their ministries when they start their ministries. They prophesied that he would not see corruption. He would, the Lord would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. That means he would not allow the Lord Jesus Christ to decay back to dust. But he raised him from the dead, undoing the curse. This is the central theme of Scripture. As you are under a curse, I am under a curse of death. Right? And we carry around this body of death. And when we become Christians, we get a new nature. We get a new nature. Now, that nature is hidden in God in Christ and will be revealed in us when we are manifest with him, right? And then we receive our new bodies, our celestial bodies, right, that cannot sin. That's all 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, the resurrection, the new body, the new tent. 
This is what we're looking forward to. This is what we groan for. We groan with all of creation, Scripture says in Romans. We groan in this body of death because we hate it. We hate, we hate its weaknesses. But one of the things people do because of their weaknesses is they adopt traditions. Because by traditions, they feel as if they're participating. They feel as if they're doing something. Again, I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm just saying if what you practice is drawing away from Christ, like Christmas. Like I said, it's weird that people will do all the religious stuff at Christmas that God never asked them to do, right? All the religious stuff that surrounds it. And then they get upset with me because I go see Santa's Village at the mall and listen to Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer music and Bing Crosby and Dean Martin and Johnny Mathis at Christmas. I love it, right? They get upset with me because of that, but I don't put any stock into it. It's all meaningless to me. It's just fun. It's just sort of Americanism. It doesn't mean anything. They're the ones that are putting stock into their advent calendars as if they're pleasing God, and they're having manger scenes. It's amazing to see evangelical Christians who don't believe in statues, who don't believe, uh, who've, who've rebelled over the many years and suffered for hundreds of years when they were uh, getting rid of statues or condemning the use of kissing and worshiping images. They build an image in their home, a fake image anyway, because the manger scenes aren't biblical. Again, I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm not upset with them. I'm just curious. I just think it's sort of stealing away from God by your tradition. Right? It's sort of the thing the Lord talked about with uh, with Israel when he was here. So we're already 16 minutes in, and I did mention Lent, and I do have on my uh, blog, www.context of confusion, something I call Lent Comes of Age. Now, I'm just, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's there if you care, but I'm just going to talk about how we get to these traditions. Now, first of all, Lent itself was, and again, I read from original sources. I'm not making this up, right? It was the count, it was formalized at the Council of Nicaea in 8325, all right? So it's old, but it's not biblically old, right? And I, again, you know me, I'll read the early church fathers, but I don't care, meaning they're not authoritative. I'll consider what they have to say. But they don't tell me what the church is supposed to be. Because remember what Paul wrote. Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Uh, Paul said to the Ephesians when he was in Ephesus in the book of Acts, that as soon as I leave, grievous wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. Right? Immediately. This is in the book of Acts. And then post-Acts, when Paul's writing, right, he's warning them in Colossians, as we talked about Colossians 2, about these traditions of men. They're going to rob you of your reward. This is all early. And then Paul's last epistle, 2 Timothy, he says, all in Asia had abandoned him. Right? We talked about that before. And in Philippians, the enemies of the cross of Christ. These are Christians, by the way. We talked about that before. These are people that come in and rob you of your reward. Rob you of the enlightenment of the dispensation of the mystery of God. Right? And you can go back and listen to those messages. And rob people of seeing scripture because they get you on this other tack. They get you on this tack of here are a bunch of traditions you can do and feel special. So then at Christmas time, you get upset with me because I don't have a manger scene. You get upset with me because I don't have the baby Jesus, you know, and all these unbiblical things. And you get upset with me because I have Santa Claus, which I don't care about. But you're the one that's in danger of, of now again, if you do an advent calendar, I gotta be careful here. People do these things, advent candles and calendars. You can do whatever you want. You have liberty to do whatever you want. I'm just saying, be careful. Don't put any stock into it. And don't think God is pleased with you because you do this. He never asked you to do it. This is one of the traditions of men, right? So that's fine. If you Again, you're free to do anything you want. Just, you know, be careful. Well, anyway, at 325, and then uh, we have Pope Gregory writing to Augustine of Canterbury, issued the following rule. We abstain from flesh, meat, and from all things that come from flesh as milk, cheese, and eggs, Right? This is from catholiceducation.org. Second, the general rule was for a person to have one meal a day in the evening at 3 p.m. Okay, so here's the first thing that come along. Now, now we're at 600, 80, 600, and the Pope declares that all meat during Lent. Now, this is fish, too. So everybody, well, I eat fish, I eat fish on Fridays, you know. Well, you couldn't even eat fish. It was no flesh, meat, and anything that even comes from that, like milk, cheese, and eggs, right? So, and you can only have one meal a day in the evening or 3 p.m. I don't know why that distinction. All right, but this was eventually abandoned, and they changed these rules over the years. So, again, if you want to say it's old, it's old. Well, as we come forward, it becomes the stuff that's less old is now what you do, right? So we came along, and now it's uh, they they allowed you to eat fish, and at first, and then they even abandoned it during the week. It's only Ash Wednesday and Fridays during Lent, right? So that's what happened. That's according to Christian Catholic education. I know that because I grew up in it. 
Right? I told this story before that there was every Lent I tried to get through, and I got through one Lent where I didn't have meat on any Friday. And then I remember that it was actually Good Friday. I, I went in the refrigerator, and uh, we had just gotten some ham from the deli, which, again, growing up in Philadelphia, good ham from the deli. And I just picked out a piece of that you know, thinly sliced ham, shoved it in my mouth, and as soon as I swallowed it, I'm like, oh, it's Good Friday. Now, I didn't consciously do it saying, I'm going to eat meat, because that's how, in Catholicism, you have to have this wantonly desire to commit sin for it to actually be sin. But if I did do that, it is damning, all right? So anybody who doesn't want to understand Catholicism, uh, it's like if you don't go to Mass on any Sunday or any Holy Day because you get up going, I'm just not going to go to Mass today because I don't want to, that's a mortal sin. It's a grave sin. If it's not confessed and absolved, you burn in hell if you die, right? That's the official teaching. But you have to wantonly say, I'm not going to go to Mass today. But it's every Sunday and every Holy Day of Obligation, unless your bishop says you don't have to that Holy Day of Obligation. It's a whole other thing, right? All these traditions, all these traditions. But we're going to finish this up by saying this. This is how it happens and this, and we're guilty of this too, evangelicals. Uh, we're guilty of this too. Here's how, here's how these traditions come along. Now remember, Paul never said anything about this Lent or Advent or anything else like that. And even the oldest version of Lent, nobody does anymore. So you can't just say, you know, it's early church fathers, early church fathers, and the Pope, the Pope, the Pope. You know, well, they said a lot of things you don't do, right? So anyway, here's the progression. You have something that doesn't exist. Lent doesn't exist. All right. So some guy comes along and makes it up. Now, I say makes it up, but a lot of times it's borrowed from pagan religions. Right. A lot of things that we do are borrowed from the pagans and they just uh, transmogrified over to the Christian faith. Like hell. We've talked about that. The Greek mythology that goes along with that. So anyway, it doesn't exist. Some guy makes it up or borrows it from from paganism. So now it gets a little bit older. Right. Now it gets older and it starts to change. It starts to change. Now, and then the next step is we start referring to it as an ancient custom, an ancient tradition, a tradition of the fathers, the early church fathers, right? And if you go to a lot of our seminaries, they love and worship the early church fathers. In fact, they think they like Arrhenius and Augustine and Aquinas more than they like Paul. In fact, we talked about this before, that R.C. Sproul, the late R.C. Sproul, wrote in his blog or whatever he called it back then, that Aquinas was the greatest Christian mind, the greatest mind of the Christian age. Ah, no, not Paul, but the greatest mind of the Christian. Now, he might mean post-Paul, but still, Aquinas wrote some absolute garbage on the gospel-denying doctrine of purgatory. So anyway, so it doesn't exist. Somebody makes it up or steals it from paganism. It gets older. <clears throat> it gets older and then changes. Now we start calling it ancient. Now nobody remembers at this point that somebody just made it up, Right. Now, we might, we might go back and uh, go through history and say, okay, here's where it started. Pope so-and-so, or early church father so-and-so, or it came out of the Greek tradition, or it came out of, you know, the Asia Minor, or whatever we want to do, it came, you know, whatever. And so now it's ancient, it's old, they attach it to some name of some early church father, or somebody who's got an old Greek-Latin name, and now it's true. Now it's just true, and now it's, it takes on a whole life of its own, even though it looks nothing like it did at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and it has, it's not in scripture and it steals and robs from what is in scripture. This is what the tradition is, traditions of men do. And again, we're warned about this sort of stuff in Colossians 2, that this is going to rob from you. Now, in another version of that is you have things like that are biblical, like the, the law and the Ten Commandments and the, the Old Covenant. But that's when we have to rightly divide and say, but that doesn't fit this age. And we've talked about that a hundred times. You can go listen to the recent messages or go back even further in these podcasts and look for things on dispensationalism or the mystery, particularly the church is not Israel, which is one I did recently, and Israel is not the church. Well, you have to make these clear distinctions. So even things that are biblical, now again, it's in the Bible. I can't believe you saying that. It's in the Bible. Well, we talked about that. There's a lot of things in the Bible you don't do, nor should you do. And again, you're not building an ark. You're not sacrificing sheep. You're not going to Jerusalem for the feasts. All these things are biblical, but you're not doing them, right? So, because we understand we have to draw these lines. So all that said, I love tradition in a lot of ways, but I put no stock in it in my personal life. When it comes to my biblical life, I want to do what the Lord says. I want to follow him as closely as I can in the age in which the Lord has placed me in the before the foundation of the world. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, go listen to recent messages on uh, before the foundation of the world versus 
since the foundation of the world. The blessings I have in the far above the heavens, not on the earth. I want to be living in a heavenly citizenship, not an earthly one. I'm not looking for an earthly kingdom, even though some people will have that. I'm looking for the blessings in the far above the heavens at the right hand of the Father where the sun sets. When he is manifest, I'll be manifest with him. That's what I'm looking for. That's the life I want to live. That's the glory I want to bring to him. So I'm not, I don't do Lent. I really, I don't do the holiday weekend. Now, of course, when Sunday comes, I will thank the Lord for the resurrection, but I should thank him for the resurrection every day. And hopefully I glorify the resurrection on this podcast. It is, and I will say it again, the central event of all history. Now, again, God is outside of time. So all we understand is time. So in the constraints of time, the only thing we understand is everything from what God has revealed to us from creation to the end of the ages ahead of us in time. We don't know what's beyond time. We can't comprehend it. So in all that, the greatest event, the greatest is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the undoing of the curse, and the curse is death, and the enemy is death, right? So we don't, we shouldn't celebrate death. It's the enemy, but we celebrate life in Christ. We celebrate having life through his name, and we celebrate our resurrection someday. So I'm going to finish there. So if you're going to have traditions, make them fun, and make them, and don't cross them over with your Christianity, and don't make your Christianity part of your tradition, or your tradition is part of your Christianity. You'll just be robbing from yourself. So until next time, when Michael's less upset, possibly, probably not. I'm a very upset kind of guy, obviously. Uh, just uh, rock on.